Now, um, I'm pleased to, to introduce uh, Dr. John Mills. Um, John will be giving a presentation on the ever relevant, always fascinating topic of countertransference. John has been a practicing clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst for nearly 30 years. He runs a mental health corporation in Ontario, Canada, where most of his clinical activities involve the supervision of clinicians, trainees, and mental health professionals who are seeing clients from children to adults for assessment and treatment under his clinical direction. Um, again, uh, oh, and John has also indicated that, that um, uh, to feel free to ask questions uh, as he presents, so you don't necessarily have to wait for the Q&A uh, sec uh, section, um, but um, if you choose to do so, that's fine too. And I noticed a number of you uh, put questions, post your questions on the chat board uh, by clicking uh, everyone, which is great. You, that's, you can totally do that. Or if you would like to have your question asked anonymously, you can send me a private uh, Zoom chat message. Um, so uh, welcome, John. Well, thank you for having me, everyone. Um, yeah, um, this is obviously a big topic, so I will uh, try to stay a bit focused. Um, for those of you that are entering into your career or training where you want to conduct supervision, um, I just thought I would share my, my experiences with you to some degree. Um, you know, there are many different types of, uh, you know, of supervisory arrangements. So I'm not exactly sure um, where you might fit in and if it might be varied for some of you. Uh, not a uniform kind of process. So I hope, uh, I hope to cover something that, um, you know, can address a number of different grounds. I, I guess um, the first one is whether or not, you know, you as the supervisor are in an evaluation role versus a consulting role. Hmm. Um, and I think that's very important to, to establish because, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot different when you're consulting with someone uh, where they're not necessarily obligated to follow your thoughts or advice versus in an evaluation role uh, where there's a certain degree of authority that you would have over uh, the supervisee. Uh, the same is like with an employee. And so um, I, I'm always in a, a, a typically in a role where I am both evaluating as well as I am the employer. And so I have certain expectations uh, for how my clinical staff uh, are going to, um, you know, to operate. Um, for me, uh, supervision is mandatory for my, my staff. I, I have people who are from diverse backgrounds. So it could be anywhere from mental health um, clinician to a you know, counseling person to social worker to a registered psychotherapist uh, to a psychologist. Um, I also have some people who would be considered lay analysts, meaning that their their graduate degree uh, or PhD is not in the mental health field, but in something like um, religious studies or literature or something of that. Um, uh, caliber, but they went through a psychoanalytic training program. So these these kind of parameters kind of uh, can determine the way I approach supervision. But the first thing is, you know, establishing an atmosphere. And um, on one hand, uh, this is not therapy, but on the other hand, uh, you know, it can be extremely intimate. And um, at, at the same time, um, this is not my professional friend. Like if I have colleagues or friends, that's entirely different. So it, it is much more of a, um, you know, a formal but not necessarily stiff relationship and arrangement. Um, so some of this is um, uh, approached where, uh, from practical matters. Uh, so for instance, a typical my typical supervision with someone could either be uh, individual or it can be in a group. And there are pros and uh, cons to those arrangements. 
when you have group supervision, other trainees or other supervisees can learn from, uh, from other people while they're presenting their cases, but that also might um, be more intimidating for them to bring up personal matters that they don't want others to know. So just navigating those dynamics. But when, um, when I see people individually, um, especially over time, um, usually my, my people are with me for, for years, um, I, I approach it like um, I, I would, in many ways, a therapy arrangement that it's based upon confidentiality and trust. And that's something that is not going to be automatic. It's, it's something that's going to be earned, meaning um, I have to earn the supervisee's trust. And how do we accomplish that? Uh, well, I, I like to start out by saying, um, you know, what I, how I look at my role and what I'm here for. And I'm here for the professional development of, uh, of the trainee or the supervisee. And, um, and I also encourage complete honesty with me. Um, I mean, I'll, I learn more about how to be a, a supervisor by how I was mistreated by my supervisors, uh, both in my clinical um, psychology doctoral uh, program, my internship, my postdoc, my psychoanalytic training. And um, basically, um, the, what I kind of learned is um, there's a lot of people that get hung up on these power uh, hegemonies and, and, and like to um, exert this type of uh, uh, narcissistic dominance over, over the supervisee. I'm just the app completely opposite. Um, I don't think I'm going to accomplish anything by doing that, and I'm not sure I'm going to help um, my supervisees at all. But at the same time, um, having total honesty with me is, um, is to invite direct communication that's not going to be judgmental, um, uh, yet honest and open. And this is how we establish a, uh, you know, a relationship based on you know, trust and, and openness. Um, I always invite people to take advantage of the things they don't want to talk about. So um, you know, countertransference can be a dirty word in certain circles and in certain professional environments. I mean, particularly in Canada, where the dominant form of treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy. This is what's taught in the, uh, in the PhD programs, um, mainly by professors who don't even have a private practice. So they, a, lot, a lot of clinicians are very clunky. They are gimmicky. They are actually, to be quite honest, an embarrassment. So um, when they are, when, when they meet me for the first time, it brings in a, an analytic um, or psychodynamic uh, orientation, broadly conceived, uh, that I invite them, I encourage them to talk about countertransference. And some of them, you know, uh, are a bit intimidated about it. But I, I think that being open to talking about mistakes, insecurities, vulnerabilities, uh, your affect about your patient, uh, that we should really embrace these things because we're going to learn a lot from, from engaging this material. Um, so, uh, you know, setting the stage for this is that the, the expectations are that you can bring in your cases um, and you can decide how you, you would like to uh, present uh, the cases to me. Uh, some are going to be um, much more of a case formulation that you, uh, that I, I just want to get a sense of how a, a clinician works. And if I, if I just rely upon them to come in and talk, you know, minimally about people without getting into depth, then I, I don't get a good sense of how they're conceptualizing uh, cases. 
But then we also have to address very practical matters. Uh, so when some crisis happens, uh, issues around legalities, around running the practice, around ethics, around reporting obligations, um, you know, the, these types of things will come up uh, almost in every, you know, supervision session. But um, the, uh, the there's, there's kind of three, three levels of counter-transference issues that come up. One is the counter-transference that the supervisee happens to be discussing in, about their therapy cases. But also they can have a counter-transference to supervision and, um, and what that means. Um, and then of course, the supervisor can have his own counter-transference to the supervisee. And, and so these three kinds of levels um, can occur. Um, I, uh, I like to model what I would expect, um, uh, you know, what, what I expect of my supervisee. So, um, if I feel that I'm, you know, not um, operating with full, with all my gears that day, I will talk about what, why I'm not maybe available, why am I not listening, what is is about us. But usually the relationship is not the dominant focus. It can be over time once, you know, you develop um, a relationship with, uh, with the supervisee. But um, getting back to uh, encouraging the client, or I'm mean, sorry, th that's a nice slip, see? Uh, the, the slip is seeing the supervisee as the client. But in many ways, um, that is kind of how I approach it. Um, I like to know how they think. So let's say I'll, I'll, I'll establish a parameters of expectations that yes, you can bring in cases, but I don't want to hear about how how great and wonderful you are working with certain clients. I mean that that is not why you're here. You you want to get the most out of this, and that means uh, bringing in cases that you're struggling with, that you you're feeling vulnerable with, uncertain about, are not transpiring in the way that you perhaps would like, and inviting um, the, a whole gamut of your you know, personal intimate uh, reactions to, uh, to the clients. Um, so I, I'll start out with that, that, that. That's what I would think that you're going to get the most out of rather than some banal supervision where, you know, people talk about, you know, following this technique or this treatment plan or doing this. Um, so, so I try to model that. I might even um, uh, start, when I first get to know somebody, I might start by presenting a case to them so they can get an idea of who I am, how I work, and it's usually a long-term patient of mine that I'll talk about. Uh, so I, I, might, I might encourage them to, to, when they're starting to bring in cases, that, that we would take some um, you know, some of your cases that, that are more perhaps long-term in duration. And, uh, and then also uh, try to focus some attention or time on that. Not every session or supervision session, but, but frequently. So I, 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 like to, I like to find out what their theoretical orientations are and, um, and how they go about conceptualizing a case. You know, how, how do they go about, or who do they identify with in terms of, um, uh, you know, theorists, in terms of the nature of therapeutic action, um, what, what they feel the, the, the goals or the ingredients of, of a good, you know, good therapy is about. And then I can gauge how sophisticated a person is, you know, how, how much they have um, read in the literature, how much they have been exposed uh, to um, a whole gamut of, of thinking. Um, some people are, like I said, quite um, you know, embarrassingly naive about how to even go about conceptualizing a case. Uh, and then other people, of course, are more sophisticated depending upon their background, where they came from. 
uh, in their education and training history. So um, by encouraging the case formulation, I say you know, like, I'd like for you to pick a, you know, pick a couple cases that we'd like to work in t over, over time on. And I, I, as you might imagine, I, I would want to know about their developmental history, um, what's the relationships with their, uh, with their parents, uh, significant others, things like that. Um, some, sometimes it's rather surprising that supervisees will bring in cases, but they've not even really ever discussed um, uh, their patient's childhood. Um, and I'm thinking, well, how can you come to understand uh, them without that? They'll be focused only on what the patient brings in and the immediacy of their lives. Um, that's why in the beginning, when I see patients, um, I talk about it as a consultation period rather than um, therapy. Uh, and, and that's where I want to spend at least three sessions trying to you know, more or less um, interview them to understand uh, you know, the, the, the gamut of their, their life uh, before uh, we decide whether or not uh, we want to work with one another. And I think this is, some, and sometimes patients, uh, you know, it's like an interview. <laughs> you, you, you're being interviewed to whether or not they want to um, commit. And so um, I think this is important when we're, we're establishing um, a relationship. So uh, the, the supervisees, um, I, I, I like to get a sense of um, what is their main symptomatology and what is their main, their main defensive structures. So, um, you know, you don't always get that right away. It usually organically progresses over time where you are, are feeling out their defensive overlays versus what are the presenting problems that they're coming in with. Um, I also, I also like to ask, you know, what, what is the essence of this patient? What, uh, you know, what are the essential dynamics? What are the internal conflicts? You know, what are the key themes and issues that pervade this person's life? Um, you know, when Freud talks about the sense of a symptom, I think there's an essence that is um, operative in the psychological um, you know, organizations of, of patients. And, and defenses and personality structure often overlap. In fact, one can make a case that character is basically the, um, uh, the dy a dynamic process of ongoing defenses. But getting a feel uh, of, of, of a person's, um, you know, personality structure helps me as a supervisor so I want, to, I want to feel the patient, even though I don't see them, I don't know them. So what kind of personality or uh, organization do they have? Or are they more anxious by nature? Are they depleted? Are they empty? Are they aggressive, uh, you know, negative individual? Um, are they schizoid, um, paranoid, narcissistic, like overly inflated? Uh, or they are more on borderline uh, level of organization, or uh, if we want to use the term primitive. So th those are the things. Um, I like to get a sense of how they, they conceptualize a case. And um, if I'm dealing with someone who's quite new or novice uh, to the profession or haven't been exposed to much, I, I'll give them um, reading lists like I, I normally would in a, in a seminar. And I, I want them to, um, to read up on some classic papers so they get a, they get a sense of um, how a, a, a psychodynamic clinician works. Um, and then uh, with that, I'd like to know what kind of phase of treatment they're in. Um, you know, is this an ongoing case? Is it a new case? How, how long have you seen the patient? What is the therapeutic dyad like? What's the relationship between the two of you like? Um, and then, of course, getting into uh, the thick of things, what's the transference and the countertransference material? 
been about up, up until this time. So um, once the kind of the groundwork is laid um, and, uh, and, you know, supervisees see that I'm, I'm, you know, human like anyone and I'm not going to be there to grill them or make them feel bad, uh, like some supervisors uh, have uh, a reputation for. Um, yeah, I, I, I basically said, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of, of judgment, um, that we're here to learn, um, or making mistakes, or uh, issues around shame, um, or feeling exposed. Um, but that's how we learn. And uh, often, um, if a person's, you know, embroiled in a counter, in kind of transference and acts in the treatment, the treatment's not going to, going to do well. In fact, it will suffer if it won't, it will lead to a premature termination. Usually clients just bolt. Um, um, if that, if, if uh, these uh, kind of transference and acts are, are, aren't shored up or if ruptures aren't shored up or impasses. Um, so, um, I, you know, as a comparative analyst, I, 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 I work from different conceptual models at any given time. So depending upon where the supervisee is at, what, who they identify with, um, are, are they uh, much more of, a, let's say, a contemporary relational uh, therapist versus more of a, a post-classical um, uh, kind of analytic attitude person. Um, uh, are they so from a self psychology background uh, or more of a, you know, British school object relations approach? Are they Lacanian? Are they Jungian? Um, these, these make a difference in how people uh, view clinical phenomenon and being open to their points of view uh, is important to validate uh, and it also gives me the opportunity to introduce, uh, you know, a number of ways of thinking about a case that may complement or um, may be different from, from how the, uh, the supervisee sees their patient. Um, with having said that, there's a pl plurality or a range of interventions that I think are permissible for any clinician. And I, I'm not hung up on this notion that something is uh, like a, a correct or the right technique to uh, employ. Um, I mean, these are moot issues. Um, uh, and often we learn that um, you know, some, some patients work much better with certain types of approaches than others. If people just come in and take a a top-down approach where they superimpose uh, their own way of working on a client, like this is what you see, at least I see a lot in, in Canadian clinicians that, you know, they're taught silly things. I mean, like giving homework assignments and like, what, what are you doing? You know, who taught you that? Why, why do you think the client who's not asking for that would want it? Um, you know, these types of uh, teaching someone like how to think or how to act or how to behave is not um, something that I encourage. I, I, I encourage much more of a process oriented approach to, to the treatment, which uh, could be experiential near or it could be far. It could be based upon um, how the past conditions this person's current life, and it needs to be understood in the context of their, um, their suffering. So um, having, get, you know, trying to lay out these permissible spaces and boundaries in the supervisory relationship usually leads to um, supervisees opening up greatly about themselves, their, um, their own vulnerabilities, their own developmental traumas, uh, and um, 
their, you know, their, their life in general. Um, I allowed, I allowed, I allowed the, the supervisee to talk about whatever they want to talk about with me. Um, and I encourage it. And uh, when somebody's vulnerable, I mean, sometimes supervisees will break down crying because they're in touch with stuff that's happened to them that the patient is soliciting or eliciting. Um, and that's uh, okay. However, um, I'd, I'd be a bit concerned if, 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 you know, if the supervisee is, is crying in the session to, to, uh, in front of the patient. Um, so main, maintaining um, uh, this kind of pro professional decorum is, uh, is important. Um, you know, uh, just thinking about one, one supervisee who actually did that was crying with the client, um, let, you know, leads to these feelings that the client now has to take care of the, uh, the therapist. And, and the, um, uh, you know, this kind of um, counter-transference enactment and dependency relationship where the, the patient feels a burden on, 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 the, on the therapist who, who can't contain their own anxieties or emotional pain um, is, is usually not uh, going to lead to um, uh, very effective treatment. So uh, another thing that I um, like to, to bring in when working with the countertransference is that countertransference and, and projective identification are almost synonymous. Uh, they, they operate on different levels because a, a projective identificatory process is an unconscious communication and it's, it's two-way street that's happening um, in, in the unique dyad or the unique moments of the treatment. And um, I, I, I like to introduce this to people who don't understand what projective identification is. But in, in short, in summary, um, it uh, is a clinical process that hap uh, happens that, um, where the um, patient will project certain unconscious fantasies or behavioral fantasies onto the therapist and the therapist unconsciously is identifying with them and takes that up into their internal structure without, uh, without being able to separate out what's happening in the moment. Um, and often this leads to counter-transference um, phenomenon and, and there's there's so you know there's so much literature and material on countertransference, but for our purposes, let's um, let's assume that there is m six main categories. What I would call therapeutic enactments, which could be many different things, um, uh, often often around a loosening of the frame. So people who um, you know don't start on time. Um, uh, are not attentive to uh, the 50 minutes or whatever, uh, 45 minutes, depends upon who, how long you see patients for. Um, uh, carelessness around, uh, you know, client arrangements and, 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 and things like this. Um, like I remember one <laughs> supervisee uh, was taking, w w let, let, uh, let his client, who was a stripper, uh, rake up a three thousand dollar bill in a cash industry, and of course she she disappears on him. So things things like uh, around the frame is is important to not breach uh, for for a number of reasons, and that that would be one of them. Um, you know, another another type of uh, countertransference is this feeling of passivity. You know, you might find yourself not really very interested in the patient, not being very attentive or concentrating in the session, feeling aloof, distant, bored, things like that. Um, anxiety is another type of uh, category um, when the patient is uh, making you uh, anxious for a variety of reasons. Um, you might feel like you want to avoid them, um, 
you might feel helpless at times or intimidated um, that uh, whatever, the, whatever the reason may, might be, the client's eliciting this in you. Uh, um, aggressivity is uh, another, another type. Um, you know, you, just don't, you end up just not liking this person. And why is that? Um, well, there's a number of reasons, of course. Um, but you may uh, get to a point, like Winnicott talking about hate and the counter-transference, that you end up developing a uh, you know, perverse negative uh, you know, attitude. And it's, it's certainly interfering with um, doing quality work. Um, I, I remember uh, a supervisee who had a patient that he absolutely despised. He hated them, this person. And <clears throat> it had to do with um, somewhat cultural issues. Uh, the supervisee was Jewish. The uh, patient was an Italian who had uttered anti-Semitic remarks in the session. And this led, led to him having to um, assert his, uh, you know, his stance on this matter and what his background was from and which led to ruptures. But anyway, um, what happened was uh, the patient ends up, uh, well, the supervisee tells me this story that he's reading, he's reading in the paper and all of a sudden, uh, he's, he's reading about a man who uh, keeled over on his bicycle and died from a heart attack. And then he reads the name of his patient. He starts breaking out in hysterical laughter. <laughs> so um, he hated him that badly. I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> instead of like, you know, why, why are you continuing to work with this person? You know, wouldn't, wouldn't you have um, wanted to to give a referral if, if these types of feelings were, um, uh, you know, infecting the treatment. Uh, another familiar type of counter-transference is, um, you know, er eroticism, where, um, you know, there, there's sexual uh, seductiveness or tensions or attraction or lust for, for the patient. And, um, and then that becomes much more of a a preoccupation for the therapist. And then narcissistic vulnerabilities in us uh, is another um, category. So, uh, you know, leading, you know, our own insecurities, our own, um, uh, you know, feelings of shame, of guilt, of inferiority, uh, of uh, entitlement, of inflation, um, the, these, these elements uh, will creep in. Now, um, in, in terms of another um, related um, type of counter-transference, I, I found that it, it, it relates to the attachment style of the, um, of the client. So, um, you know, so a person who struggles with, let's say, secure or insecure attachment to people, um, I, I might find myself in many ways, kind of emulating or mirroring the um, the way that the client will come across. Um, it, let's suppose a person has more of an ambivalent attachment style, um, or they're avoidant, um, where they just you know they just dismiss people or events uh, versus being really preoccupied. Uh, maybe in an angry way about, um, about certain events or certain people versus a more disorganized um, and disoriented feeling that might come up um, in the treatment, uh, not to mention maybe uh, someone who's just not very capable of attaching and there's a feeling of detachment um, that you might get with certain types of you know, schizoid types of uh, people. Anyway, um, the, these are the things that I, I like to, if I, I notice them, I will bring up and, and introduce, um, uh, you know, ask these questions and want to bring them out in the supervisee. And it will often be done in, in ways where I'll ask questions. Um, I'll ask them to reflect on, them, 
on themselves? What, what were they thinking uh, when they said this or had done this? Um, I don't, uh, I don't have, I, I used to at one time, but I don't now. Um, I used to ask uh, supervisees to bring in pay, uh, uh, tapes of their actual um, sessions, but it became difficult to getting patients to agree to having their sessions taped and there's an intrusive element. And of course, you know, with, with that, uh, you always have the big other there the superego that um, is, uh, could potentially interfere. So I, I did away with that, um, instead relying on good process notes. Um, so before I end uh, and, and open it up to questions, um, one thing that I, I find valuable, uh, or people have told me so, is that, um, if you're thinking about the countertransference and projective identification, that um, that noticing these things um, and, and 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 being attuned to them when they happen can really make a difference in the types of reactions or or interventions that um, the supervisee will will have. Um, but the thing is that we're not always aware of it when it's happening. And um, so what, what I want to propose is that, that projective identification is happening all the time. It is hidden, hence it's unconscious communications. And the projective identification from the patient can s stir something up in the therapist that's a similar experiential self-state that the patient is likely experiencing. Um, so often you might become aware of this heightened temporal sense of um, internal emotive experience in yourself as a therapist. Like there's an affect that, that usually is strong, comes over, and it, but it's qualitatively different than your more normal or neutral way of relating usually the, it feels like it's a, like it's almost like a seizure coming something that is affecting you uh, your internal self states um and and so what i think is happening is if we use let's say we'll use freud's model of um signal anxiety that here we have it you know an affect a affect signal and um, this is alerting you when you're, when you're in touch with that, that signal affect. It's alerting you in the moment that something's going on here uh, about being communicated about the patient's uh, internal motives or fantasies. And if you can become aware of that in yourself, what that's eliciting in you, the feelings that you have, if you, if you can catch it in the moment. Usually you have to reflect upon the, on the session, uh, digest it, analyze it, and then you can bring the material back in. Um, so, uh, you know, and let's say the next session. But if you're, if you're attuned and you are in touch with this uh, affect, um, you might be able to, to process it right there. Uh, what, what I, uh, what I think is, is going on is that if I become aware of something in myself, I'm going to start speculating or at least have a hypothesis that this is similar to what's going on in the patient's state of mind. And it, it, is this what I'm experiencing their own internal experience that they would like to evacuate into me? So I, 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 I just want to become aware of it in myself and stay attuned to that, that uh, signal affect or any abrupt shifts in my self states. Um, and this is where I, you can often turn a counter transference, uh, you know, enactment into some kind of bridge for empathy. So the first thing is you have to recognize it and become, you know, become aware of it uh, when the signal experience happens. 
the second thing is just be quiet. Don't say anything. Um, you know, contain it. Keep, keep it uh, to yourself. Don't react. Uh, often people will start blurting stuff out. Um, they will uh, be defensive. But you need to then at that point step back and reflect what, what's going on here. Um, you know, holding back your own defenses or your own reactions. Um, sometimes I, I'll think about the precipitating events that led to whatever just occurred between us. And, and try to um, speculate to see whether or not my inner experiences is what they're having. And if I can, if I can go back to an event that led to, let's say, uh, a rupture or uh, the client being not liking, you know, not liking what I said or did, I, I want to try to process it together and understand what went on between us. And then uh, in that process, often it leads to, you know, a bridge um, uh, to making an empathic connection with the patient. So that's some of the stuff that I might want to encourage and, and emulate uh, with the supervisees. So at that, uh, at that point, I think I'll, it's about all I have to say. Be happy to um, take any questions. I, I, was, I, I have a question, John. Um, you mentioned earlier that, uh, that um, with certain supervisees, they'll present wanting to talk about all the good work they're doing, um, you know, and not really get into patient work um, that they're struggling with. Um, how, do you, how do you approach that when, when you encounter that kind of supervisee in terms of getting them to feel like they, you know, can talk about those more difficult, the, the things they're struggling with in their, in their clinical work? Well, um, usually I don't get people um, continually talking about how good they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that, that's not the point of why we're, we're here. And um, so I, I will, of course, praise people when I think they've done, you know, a good job or they're, they're on track with the, with the therapy. Um, but I, I will want to, you know, I'll, I, you know, a typical response would be, I, you know, I've noticed that these are the types of cases that you bring in time and time again. And I'm left wondering, how about the ones that aren't going very well? Uh, how, how do you feel about talking about those with me? And, and if there are some anxieties about the fear of me evaluating them, let's say, you know, an employee is one thing or a contract worker who I'm paying is, is yeah, this is my reputation here and I'm responsible for that case. I'm responsible for the work you're doing. So I will guide that person if I think things aren't going well um, and, and what I would do but I do it in a way that's not going to threaten them or, or, you know, devalue them, but in a nurturing, mentoring way. Um, however, if I'm in an evaluative role for someone else for, let's say they're getting their registration with their, um, uh, you know, regulatory body, I'm accountable um, to the, the body who wants my, mm -hmm. my assessment uh, of, of how they're doing. The same with someone who's, let's say, getting, um, getting their doctoral degree or um, is in a training year where they need, they need that. So I, I will nurture and encourage the people to, um, you know, to use me, so to speak, as a self-object uh, to um, get uh, you know, get, get supervision that they're not going to get or haven't gotten before. And that's just what I would encourage. Okay, sure. John, I wanted to ask you one of the questions that was asked of me <clears throat> after my, during my presentation, which was uh, when you're dealing with a countertransference and you identify an issue in your supervisee that, that uh, brings to mind 
that they could use their own psychotherapy to deal with that particular kind of transference issue? How might you handle that with a supervisee? That's a good, a good question, Alan. Um, most, I would assume most of the people that I supervise are not currently in treatment. Um, some, of course, will tell me when they are, and I, um, I always kind of model that myself, you know, like talking about you, I, you know, I was in 10 years of treatment with three different analysts, so, <laughs> uh, and you and by modeling that, it's, I encourage it. I, I'll even encourage, or I'll encourage um, supervisees to, to get in treatment. Um, mm -hmm. and, that, uh, and I'll ask them about it because um, if they haven't, uh, they're, they're not going to, I don't think they're going to be nearly as good. And, and they're certainly not going to be aware of their, their blind spots or uh, other um, obstacles to being a good clinician. John, uh, John, this is uh, Sam Alabrando. Um, what's what pl place do you see in the supervisor's vulnerability, either self disclosures or that kind of space? What cautions do you have? Do you even do it at all? Would you recommend it? Would you avoid it at all costs? What's what's your take on that? You know, as a psycho in the psychoanalytic frame, you don't necessarily do that. Well, you know, that's, that's, um, that's kind of part of my nature. So, I mean, like I, you know, I have a home office. So uh, you know, clients and supervisees see my house. They see, you know, things that um, uh, wouldn't be totally uh, kosher, so to speak, in terms of the frame. Um, I, I pretty much... Uh, feel comfortable disclosing th certain things uh, to supervisees that I've experienced, um, especially if I think it's helpful. Uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not one of those clinicians who are overly self-disclosing. I, I, I think that there's, a, you know, there's some differences, I think, between um, self-disclosures versus self-revelations versus uh, just too much information that doesn't need to be um, regurgitated. Uh, so I, 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 I try to keep the frame as a professional one, but I, I'll, tell, I'll tell clients about my, my own internal experiences. Um, and so I'll do the same with my supervisees if I think it's appropriate. Okay, thank you. I had a question. Um... I've encountered basically like three categories of people that I've supervised. Those that I feel are really naturally talented, that their education and training is just like honing and refining their knowledge and their skills. And then those that are kind of learning and open, they're green, you can tell they're inexperienced and they need training and they need to be given articles or they need to be, what you know, built up. But then people that I just think are bad therapists, people I think actually shouldn't be therapists. Um, I have never told anybody, hey, you should get out of this profession, <laughs> like you're not good at it, or you're going to do harm to people. Like, I haven't been able to say that, but ha have you encountered somebody that you just thought it's not a matter of training and skill, it's like this person is either characterologically or just not fit for this profession? Uh, yes, uh, I've had a few of these, and I fired them. So, fired. Mm. Yeah. If they're my if they're my employee or a contract worker working for me and I think they're horrible, I, I get rid of them. I, I don't I don't want my reputation to be damaged and I don't want to take a chance that the public uh, could be harmed by somebody. I've had I had to turn three uh, three uh, clinicians into the police in my wow. for a fraud. Um, so I mean, I, I've had, I have quite a few, few uh, war stories, but um, yeah, when when, uh, but if I'm in an evaluative role for where it's not an employee and I don't see that they're progressing, um, I I would tell them my concerns, and um, but I 
I don't believe I've ever told anybody you really shouldn't be in this profession. <laughs> uh, I, I probably out of my uh, sense of not wanting to, you know, to devalue them or shame them. You know, it, interestingly, in the history of Rose City, you know, we have about 70 or 80 alumni now. I think there is only one who went through her doctoral program, did a pre-doc internship, and in the course of working at Rose City realized, and I can only hope it wasn't Rose City, uh, realized, oh my God, I don't really want to do this kind of work. This kind of work just isn't suitable to me. And they ended up leaving and completely leaving the occupation. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think that can happen. Um, but more often they're not very competent and they don't see that they're not very competent. Yeah. So they're lacking you know, like a, just a reflective ego here. They, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, we get, a, we get into the profession for personal reasons. I mean, and if somebody can't admit their own, um, whatever you want to call it, neurosis, uh, their own, um, deficits, their, their own internal conflicts, uh, if, they, if they can't admit that of themselves of, of why they would even be attracted to the profession to begin with, then we have a, another problem of, uh, of a lack of a reflectiveness uh, that's needed, right? Hmm. Yeah, John, I'm wondering if you have um your supervisees, there's a power differential between you and them since you're their employer. So I'm wondering how you balance that with the, um, what you're talking about, this intimate relationship that's developing. So if the supervisee is crying with you or revealing these personal kinds of issues, um, I'm wondering how you balance that. Yeah, it, 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 at times it can be difficult um especially um yeah in in when a person's vulnerable like that and they talk about their their, their past their history what's happened things like that um I, but I, I i treat it like it's confidential and and um or they wouldn't have told me and that it's okay and um uh, there's been times that i i would have to slip into more of a therapeutic role, um, you know, to support uh, that person in the moment, um, uh, or use it as a, uh, a way of, um, you know, suggesting they can, like I think Alan said earlier, to, to continue to get some therapy. Um, but contractors are a little different than the employees, so, I, uh, so the contractors can come and go, they're independent. Um, and I, I, have, I, they are more likely to to open open up more. I think that than my um, my four employee employed therapists. Yeah. But it's a good point you you bring up. You know, to what to what degree are these boundaries uh, fluid? Right. Right. To what degree do you want to encourage uh, you know someone to regress or? or become a blithering uh, ball in your, in your supervised time. Um, but um, what, whatever comes up, I just deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, as you say that though, I could also imagine a situation where it might lead to an ethical or a legal uh, outcome. Um, such as um, uh, somebody feeling that I uh, may have overstepped my boundaries by by even suggesting that they talk about their own countertransferences, which by definition is going to be talking about your own sense of self. Um, I think it's, it's such a fine line that we walk as, you know, trained as analysts because countertransference is personal. And yet, how do you walk that line when you're training someone or there's a power differential so that, um, you know, you still sustain and support the professionalism and the model? 
while also bringing in, you know, we use ourselves in the therapy. So, you know, it's, it's a really fine line, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a very good point. Have, have you encountered that yourself or you've not, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. With supervisees where it becomes, it starts to become too personal or too much about them. And it's, I guess it's often a matter of degree. Like if it comes up once in a while, yeah. you, know, if, you know, once in a blue moon, um, a supervisee, you know, is upset and crying. But if it's consistent or consistently about them, you know, it starts to become problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then, you know, I also think in a way we're modeling what we'd like them to be able to do in the session with their patients. So containment's really important. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, again, I think these are complicated and difficult issues. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Thanks for raising that. Yeah. I have a, a question about um, once you're, you've kind of maybe made a recommendation to a supervisee about finding their own therapy, um, it, it, that wouldn't eliminate or change the fact that they do have their own personal issues and their own countertransference that come up. And I, I guess my question is about to what degree can you, as a dyad, maintain an awareness of their issues while not going into them so much and talk about how they might impact the treatment? Um, and, and sort of where is, where is over the line there and where is just recognizing that this supervisee, they're their own instrument and they have to be aware of their own, uh, of their own stuff. No, excellent point. Yeah, I think that definitely, uh, is, you know, frequently comes up in, in supervision. Um, it, I'm kind of reminded of uh, a few situations uh, from the past, but so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, how do, you, how do you navigate this when it happens? Um, that um, let's say uh, I, I, I'm in agreement with you that I, I wouldn't want to encourage a, uh, a deep exploration of, of someone's, you know, childhood pain or abuse or trauma, uh, but to note it um, and that those are vulnerabilities that you're going to have come, coming back uh, when you're working with certain clients, let's say, who are traumatized um, and that Sometimes people have um, recognized that they that there are certain population groups they shouldn't be working with, and and knowing your own limits, I think is important. Um, like for instance, I would um, not uh, when I was receiving people. I haven't taken on a new patient since two thousand and eight, but um, when I was receiving people. I, I would not work with pedophiles and I would not work um, with people who were uh, in corrections or forensic population. Oh, yeah. And I, I knew that these are things that would uh, not be good for me and I probably wouldn't be helping the patient. So I know, I know my limitations. And so when clients, I mean, when supervisees would identify clients, sometimes they'd realize that yeah, I'm not really uh, well suited working with these kinds of people and and that's better to know and recognize uh, than to have in, you know act out uh, in the treatment mm. if that if that answers your question to some degree we, I think we can take one one more question uh, if anyone has one or if not we can stop there any any Final question someone would like to ask? No? Yeah, uh, Mona. I, I was What's curious, uh, John, I was curious, you, you just said that you haven't taken on a new patient since 2008. And I was curious about that. Is that because you're, you're not doing as much clinical work or, or you just have? Well, uh, yeah, I have, because I have, um, I, I, I have a, a, a business, I, have to uh, supervise all these people and uh, and then I also teach and I write so I uh, been quite fortunate to have uh, the luxury of um, 
uh, having a very well balanced out, uh, you know, professional role. And um, the people uh, I, I continue to see are only a handful of people that were my long term, you know, analytic cases. Um, you know, my, I still see a patient, uh, this is the 19th year I've seen her. So um, all the people that I continue to see are long term cases. Okay, well, uh, thank you, John. That was, that was a very interesting presentation and discussion. Um, uh, yeah, thanks again. That, oh. that was great. Well, thank um, you for coming in from Canada with your busy schedule. We all really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Alan, for the invite. My, my gratitude. Okay, okay. Well, um, we're going to take another break now, um, and we'll come back at 11.15. Um, so, um, yeah, let's take a break. Thanks. Thanks, all. Thanks, all right. John. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.